we as storytellers, as marketers, as whatever it is, we are not journalists and we are not documentarians or biographers. Our job is not for the centuries ahead to make sure that this is perfectly encapsulated as exactly what took place. Our job is to serve the audience and that's to tell the best story possible, to teach the lesson possible or what have you. So I'm always asking myself, does this serve the guest and the audience in the story? As a professional host, have you distilled it to an actual like method or framework or do you have, do you focus more on like gut instinct or what's, what's your secret sauce here? Yeah. So, um, if we're just talking about having a great conversation, I think, uh, early on, I was very awkward when I was younger and I realized that if you make eye contact with people and, and you hold that eye contact, that that formed a connection. Yeah. And like, I was so awkward that it's like, make eye contact, Mark, listen, oh, nod, remember to blink, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. Some really early stuff. But as a teenager, and then and then later on, I realized that, that giving people indicators that you're listening, nodding along, uh, I used to I used to go to church, I don't go anymore, but I used to go to church, and I would watch the pastor, the, the head pastor, if there was a guest speaker, I would watch him or her in the front row, nod along. And I hmm. thought, ah, that makes sense. Hmm. Whether they agree or not, they brought this speaker in. They have to be a cheerleader. And so I, I've picked up all of these little things, but but a few of them is is the the best con the the best people at hosting a conversation. You're actually just really actively listening, like very carefully and consciously listening. That's something that I that I have to do, and I don't know if it's because I, I haven't been formally diagnosed with ADHD, but my son has, and I have a lot of similar characteristics. But I don't know if it's if I listen so carefully because I'm actually worried that I'll stop paying attention, mm. and they'll stop speaking, and then suddenly I'll be like, "Oh, uh, right, it's my job to." So, so I'm right. so worried <laughs> that, like, that oh, I, there's that space. I'll, I'm supposed to be talking. I'll, that I'll lose train right. of thought. So, so I listen, I listen very carefully. Um, as they're speaking, I, I typically am thinking like things pop into my head that I want to jump on. And so I'm always just trying to decide, is this worth me interrupting their train of thought to hit them with this? Or should I just let them go? Because it's, it throws people off when you interrupt them, which is a good thing or a bad thing. So actively listening, always deciding, should I interrupt or not? And then when they come to a natural end or conclusion, or I think that they're at the end and I should cut them off, that's when I hit them with whatever is the last thing to pop into my head. Oh my gosh. The, like, the first last of all, thing that pops into my head is the thing where it's like, oh, this. And by doing so, it's very natural because I'm mm -hmm. not I'm not circling around on something a minute or two old. That's that's like that's kind of fallen off into our memory. It's turned right. to dust. Like I'm responding to the thing in oh the God. moment this is so meta and cool that i am listening intently to you talking about listening intently and i'm like the, the things you're describing are the things that i'm doing as i'm listening to you describe them so this is like very weird and awesome but i am so glad we're talking about this and and I, so okay now i like i want to go deep i want to go granular i want to get like nerd level theory here so you're listening to people because I, I hear a lot of similarities in what you're saying. Um, first of all, I, similar to you, I've never been diagnosed ADD, but I know that I have, I can, my attention can be very, very easily fragmented or fractured. And I do have to really lean in and hold space to not let that happen. And yeah, hit, like letting the sound of the other person's voice keep me drawn in is how I keep myself from, cause I actually have three, I have three monitors even plus the video screen. So, so anyway, I'm, I'm totally relating to that. When you're listening to people, I'm wondering, do you have like, this is, it's such a, I have a dance I do in my head where like you're saying, they'll say something and you'll go, Oh, I'm interested. I'm really interested to know more about that. Like, it's almost like I want to, I want to set that one on the shelf because I think I want to ask that, but I don't want to interrupt them. And then you do, you have a calculus of like, wait, is it so urgent that I need to interrupt because I want to like create this rapid ping pong volley or do I let them keep going? But knowing that if I don't, like it's stored in my flash drive, 
And if I keep listening, I might, I literally might forget it, but is it good enough that I need to interrupt so that yeah. I don't risk forgetting it? And then I have to trust that there'll be something as good or better that will surface if I keep listening and I let it go. And then I'm having to like, while I'm listening yeah. way, like how tightly do I try to hold to that? And it's like, and then which one is the one where you strike? And then if they get to the end and they pause, let's say you do remember two or three things. Do you go with the, the last one, like you said, or do you go oh, with the man. best one? Is there time to instantly do that analysis? And, and if you go back to one that's older, do you stop them and go, you know, hold on, man, that was great. But I really want to go back to something you said. And then you create these little bridge mechanisms. Yes. If you do need to roll the tape back, yeah, like I do that, I, I do can't that believe that somebody's <laughs> as nerdy about this as I am. This is amazing. Okay. So, so let me, let me paint a picture of where I learned this best. We did back in 2011, 2012, we did a reality television show that was for Who's YouTube. We? Who's uh, we? we meaning my agency, me, me okay. my agency, my team. We See, followed... I, I, I interrupt. I felt it was okay to interrupt on that yeah. because the whole audience needed clarifying content. Yeah. Yeah. No, no okay. problem. So, so me, I always say we, the Royal, we me, me and my agency, my team, we produced a, a, a television show. Uh, for YouTube with the goal of getting a broadcast contract, which we got after two seasons. But we followed we followed high net worth individuals, so rich people who did touring car racing. We would follow them each weekend for different seasons. And what I would do before the event, because you never know what's going to happen on a race weekend. You have no idea. But we were responsible for putting out really entertaining content. So I would ask around the paddock or around the garage, hey, uh, Brad, this, this driver, Brad, what's he known for? Someone say, oh, he's super aggressive. Oh, he always crashes. He always loses it. Um, oh, he's great. Whatever. I would find five or six different streams or, or themes. Then we would pre-interview Brad, and we would ask him those questions very assumptively. Hey, Brad, everyone says that you can't handle it in the corners, and you're going to overdrive the corners, and there's no way you can win. What do you think of that? Hey, Brad, I've heard that you get, you lose your temper and you get super aggressive and you turn into a terrible driver. What do you think of that? So we, we asked these the five, six, seven different mm -hmm. potentials and inevitably what would happen? Brad would lose his temper. Brad would overdrive the corner or not. Like, cause we would cover everything. And then at the end through editing, we would only pursue the line of questioning that was relevant to the story. And people would tell me, how is it that you knew to ask that question. That's crazy. Mm. Well, we followed five or six different streams of questions, and then whatever paid off was the one that was the one. And that tied with the other thing, which was on these race weekends, lots of stuff happened that we didn't have footage of. Lots of bumping and, and tires and issues and chat, lots of stuff we didn't have footage of. We can't tell those stories. If we right. don't have footage of it, we can't tell the story. We can only tell the story of the things we did have footage of. And I had to learn that it doesn't matter what really happens. The only thing that matters is the story you can tell with what you have to work with. So I relate both of these things to the interviewing mm -hmm. process for a podcast. To answer your question, when someone says something that is so good and you're like, I want to jump on it, and then the conversation moves past it, I can stop the conversation and bring us back and say, hey, I want to circle around on a point you said earlier. But I have to always, I'm always asking myself, does this serve the guest and the audience and the story? So if it goes past it, then I let it go. Just like how all these amazing things happen on the race weekend, but we have no footage of it. So we can't tell that oh, story. Oh, that's so interesting. Right? Or I just, I, I let it go. I let it go because I had... um Gosh, who was I interviewing? I was interviewing a, a Navy SEAL, uh, Jason Redman. Amazing. Oh, yeah, I love Jason. Author, great yeah. author. I'm interviewing him. And there was a no, no that, bad days. Get off the X. Uh, yeah, I love yeah. the guy, oh, right? So like, good, so, yeah. so we get three quarters of the way through the interview, and it still bothers me. There was this burning thing that I really wanted to cover off that I thought would serve the audience. And it just, it was just going to be too much work to try and get him him and the story there and it didn't it didn't serve him it didn't it would serve the audience maybe but mm. it wouldn't be great so I, I just had to let it go right it's just one of those things where it's like we, we let it go now we can as you mentioned we can interrupt we can circle back we can do a recall i can say you know 
uh, one, one thing that I do often in my questions, even like now, is I just painted, I just illustrated that, that thing about the race series. As I'm hosting and interviewing, I share my own stories and then I tie it into the next question to give extra context so it doesn't feel so much like an interview question answer question right. answer, question answer but um but yeah where do you so, want to take that man <laughs> no no so i mean this is so good so how does a person become a professional mc well you know what no one's ever asked me it's no one's ever asked me how how i become became a host or yeah you know, i like to say i like to say pro conversationalist you know like like i'm a professional conversationalist but um it's one of those things where you know, when, when I, when I, as a creative agency owner, I spent, I, I've interviewed thousands of people. I've done, we've done, we used to do two to 300 projects per year. And so you can imagine working with like an engineering firm and they have a new health and safety program. And you're like, okay, we're going to, we're going to speak to the business leaders on camera about, so I'm sitting there sitting across right. for an hour or two going like, so tell me uh, about, about why most health and safety programs fail. And like, just just stuff that's like, uh, and, and, and what I didn't realize is when you do that for years and years and years through hundreds of conversations with tons of people, I was naturally curious always, you know, we have people over, we have a couple over for dinner. I'm going to ask them, how did you meet? And, and what mm -hmm. do you do? And, and why do you, and I'm just going to pepper you with questions, but it was all just a training ground for me getting really good at, at actually just listening, trying to ask the question behind the question. Yeah. Trying to trying to get the answer that isn't the rote or, or standard answer, trying to have people say what only they can say in only their words. And I got really good at it. And then I hit this point where I would listen to talk radio or I'd be at an event or I would see someone on camera and I think I could I could do that. I could do that better than them. I know I could. And uh, eventually I just found myself hosting a podcast, you know, it's, it's manifestation, right? Like if mm -hmm. you have, the, if you have the seed plant in your head, you find yourself making moves and we do hard things is my third podcast I've done. I've been doing this for six or seven years. I, I love hosting panels. I love getting onto stage. I just decided one day that it was like, this could, this could be a thing. This is a thing. There's a value prop. I'm just going to go do it. And, and then people started telling me I was really good at it. And, and that just reinforced, like, this is a thing. Yeah, you know, there's a thing for everything. Like, yeah. there's a guy, I forget his name, but, I mean, he gets to say, let's get ready to rumble. Like, that's his job. He literally says that for a living. Yeah. Like, there's a thing for anything. And, like, I like the way you said it. Once you get the vision of the thing, then you'll start all these little micro decisions gradually confirm, you know, first they suggest the thing, then they create the thing, then they affirm the thing, then they become the thing. And then all of a sudden you're the thing. Super yeah, cool. it, took, it, took, it took me like two or three years to realize that, like, not even realize, but to get over my own fear of it. I remember, I remember being at the dentist. I remember being the dentist and, and, and the dentist, uh, the dentist person, I'll say the dentist said, oh, what do you do? And I would typically say, if I'm trying to brush people off, oh, I own a marketing agency because it's like sufficiently vague and yet people kind of understand it. And this time I decided to say, I'm a professional host. And she's like, what does that mean? What do you host? And I didn't have the courage to be like, I host a podcast and um, I host live events and I MC events and host panels. Like I just didn't have it practiced enough or I wasn't right. confident yeah, to yeah. say that. Yeah. And so I stumbled over and I remembered that. And then I'm speaking with my, uh, my lawyer and I'm talking about, you know, changes I have to make in the business and how I'm changing direction to, 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 to go this way. And I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over the words. And she goes, oh, like um, Mal Malcolm Gladwell, maybe? Like, hey, there's someone, like a reference point. Yes. Right, and, right. and I realized I need to spend a little bit of time figuring out who else does this so I could just picture it. I can explain it. And then, and then I realized when I started looking, there are tons of people who do this, like everywhere. <laughs> so... So that was part of it was just being able to realize other people do this. This is a thing. I'm going to own it. Yeah. Professional host. And I mean, what an, here's the thing. Like if you want to create possibilities for your life, I mean, I have a list here, you know, Tom Bilyeu, Grant Cardone, Les Brown, Tony Horton, David Meltzer, James Altucher. I mean, you've uh, the iron cowboy. He's actually coming on the show. I think next month. Yeah, I mean, Lawrence, you get to meet all these interesting people. You get to 
steer their conversations. You get to create relationships. You get to be memorable. Like, I mean, what an incredible, like, gateway endeavor into just about anything you could possibly want from there. Yeah, it's um, it's fun because you said steering the conversations, and and it's it's true. I I don't usually feel like I have most of the answers, which is why I prefer not to be the expert. I I have opinions, of course, but but there's so many people who've done so many more things, and so I I love the control of being able to steer the conversation, uh, and it is remarkable that simply by me showing up, and I do a ton of research, mm-hmm. I I really 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 like I'm I'm almost competitive. It's one of the only things I'm competitive about, but it really bothers me if my conversation is like a conversation they've had before. And I knew there was someone else out there that felt this. I'm the same way as well, with, this, with you, this show. But you get yeah. Les Brown on or something. You've had Les Brown on, right? I know you mm-hmm. do because, because that's how we met. But, but you have Les Brown on and it's like, I know, I know. The d- d- dude's been around. For, yeah. He's in his 70s. He, he'll go into stories. So it's like, okay, what am I going to ask him? So like for him, I was really nervous because I asked him the question, well, like, listen, man, in the 80s and 90s, you know, you're, you're, you're speaking in front of 80,000 people. You have a television show. You're on the top of the world. You're, you're married to like, I think he was married to Gladys Knight. Like, yeah. like, right. like, like you're yeah. this dude. I go, how did fame, uh, sex, drugs, alcohol, like how did all of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll not deter you from what you were doing? I don't know if he's ever been asked that question. <laughs> that is a great question. Yeah, I now I'm jealous. I wish I'd asked him that question. That's good. <laughs> and he handled it like a pro. Oh, I'm he sure sidestepped he did. it beautifully. He gave me a very amazing, thoughtful response. But it wasn't something like I was pre-planning, and I probably should plan these questions better. But more, it's just like in the moment. It's like I, I just want to. I just want to get. I want to get to the the question behind the question again. That truth. Just don't give me the the fluff. Don't give me the easy mm-hmm. answer. Let's dig deep. So, so, okay. Now this is, this is gold. All right. Cause I, uh, you know, that you are, I think you're going to be episode number 203 or four somewhere in there of this wow. show. Yeah. Congratulations. Most people get bored of podcasting way before they hit 200. Yeah. And I've, and that's in two years. So I've been going hard. Um, yeah. and, uh, I love it. I, I fucking love this man. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the network, the opportunities, the perspectives, the, I mean, you know, oh, I paid a quarter million dollars to go get a Harvard MBA. Yeah. You know what? I got to learn from a lot of the same people on your list and I could rattle off, you know, 50 or a hundred more that are like, damn, you got to talk to them. Yeah. You know, I mean, I had freaking diamond Dallas page. I haven't had professional wrestlers on my show and it's, and it's just getting, it's only now just, it's getting bigger and bigger. Literally. Three hours ago, I interviewed Dan Millman, the author of Way of the Peaceful Warrior. I read his book like 20 years ago. It changed my life. And I got to talk to him this morning. Can I tell you one of these little stories? Yeah, talk to so, me. Talk to me. So, and because, yeah. by the way, I want to geek out about this <laughs> professional host, like the science of hosting and having great conversations. That is basically okay. what I want to talk about. Okay, let's get, let's get into that. But, but if I can, right. just, just to speak to one of the benefits, one of the side benefits. Um, back in 2003, Three, I think it was 2004, Ewan McGregor, the actor, you, you know, Ewan McGregor mm-hmm. from Star Wars and from Moulin Rouge and from all of that stuff. Train um, spotting. It's one of my favorites. Train spotting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that was his third movie. Danny Boyle is the director, one of my favorite directors. Um, anyway, him and his, his good mate, Charlie Borman, decide that they're, they're going to go on a motorcycle tour. Uh, and they come up with this idea that they're going to ride around the world. I remember that. Yeah. And leave London. Okay. They're going to go all the way around the world to New York. They did this television show called The Long Way Round. I saw that show when I was starting my agency. I had it on DVD in my first week of starting my company. I had no one calling. I had no emails. I, in the background, as I was working, I was playing that TV show. And I was so inspired. It's like I went out and got my motorcycles license. I got laser eye surgery. I bought a BMW adventure bike. Like, just loved it. And then they did a second tour, and then they did a third. Well, anyway, last summer, I'm thinking, I got to get these guys on the podcast. <laughs> so, so Charlie Borman comes on the podcast. He's not promoting anything. We literally just, and, and this guy is the son of John Borman, the famous director who, who did Excalibur and did all these movies. And 
And so I have Charlie Borman on the podcast. And for like an hour and a half, we just hang out and talk. And I am like so obsessed because I, I've, I've been following this guy for like mm-hmm. almost 20 years. Like there's no re- amount of research you can do to prepare for a conversation as much as I have because right, I've right. been a fan for 20 years. So we have this a remarkable conversation. It is extraordinary. Out of everyone that I've interviewed, like really, I've, I just keeps getting better and better. But getting Charlie Borman on, man, hmm. I love that guy. It has nothing to do with business. It has everything to do with just following your passion. Yeah, it's really interesting too. Like the whole like, like I've had some of the most interesting conversations on my show with people that maybe, no, you know, very few people have heard of. Like it's, I think there's this idea that somebody's superlatively interesting because they did this huge thing. Hmm. Like what makes people interesting is honestly is like suffering. (laughs) That's basically what makes people interesting, right? And what you, your, your moment of triumph doesn't always correlate to the experience and the interest you develop through your experience of suffering and growth. And so I've had some of the best conversations from people that, you know, maybe weren't the most famous person I've had on the show, but um, it's always the most human. Whoever's got the most to say as a human being mm. usually See, I, usually wins for me. I, I think I think anyone who's is able to reflect and 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 maybe like ruminate on it, but anyone who's able to reflect and articulate what happened and what they learned is going to be a great guest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's certain people where where you know you ask, uh, and, and we don't tend to. These people tend not to get into our industry. But, but you've spoken or you've met with people who you ask a question like two or three levels deep and they're just not, they're just not kind of catching right. what you're yeah, talking yeah. about. They're like, what right. do you mean? Um, so anyone who kind of ruminates on things and really rolls things around and can really, can really connect the dots between what happened and why it happened and what you could do, they're going to be a great guest. So yeah. now I have to ask you, I mean, I don't, I don't know. This is your podcast. Like, is it, are we getting into, into the weeds? Uh, well, like two, two podcasters trying to have a podcast. I, I just say it's our podcast. We'll just go with that. <laughs> okay. Is, is this what we wanted out of our podcast episode? <laughs> yeah, no, no. They, so here's what I think is super valuable. Cause I will say this. Um, there have been conversations you know, the, the point of this podcast, I, I really believe my, honestly, it's the point of my life at this point. Um, yes, I want to be a good husband and a good father. And those are the stock answers. But the point of my life is to help people unlock their full potential and design their dream life. That is why Jeff Lerner exists, honestly. Um, I love so that. as long as we're doing that, we're spot on as far as my needs getting met. And what I look at, there have been certain conversations that I've had along the way And I'll use the one with Les Brown as an example. I had him on the show and I have discovered, I think, and I mean, anybody listening to this, unless it's their first episode, might agree with me because they're listening to me interview people um, and taking their time to do that. I've discovered I'm actually pretty good at this. Like I have been told by many people, uh, even Dan Millman told me this morning, that's one of the best interviews he's ever done. I'm good, but but I have my theories on why that is. And that's what I want to talk about. First of all, I want to dispense with false modesty. And I want to acknowledge that we're both very, very good at having conversations and asking questions to draw out rich and descriptive and very human answers from people. So let's just use that as our a priori for this conversation. And there have been conversations, again, the Les Brown, for example, I had a great conversation with him. We were scheduled for an hour and we went almost two. And he told his people, I'm having a great conversation with this guy, so I'm going to keep going. And he basically was like, shush, leave me alone. And it went. And then by the end of it, he was like, Jeff, that was great. I want you to come speak at my event. And it was short notice. I had to get tickets to New York. And that's where I met you. Mm-hmm. And that's where I met, uh, met Pedro Adao at that event. And I met some other people and other things have come. So, and that's just one example of how good conversations become portals into your potential. And if we, if we devoted this episode to the art of having great conversations so that that one time you find yourself in that one place with that one person, that if you make the right impression and if you, and, and the key is if they feel the right thing when they're talking to you, 
a whole new adventure for your life becomes possible. If we talk about that, I think we will serve the audience well. I love it. How, Let's go. How to make those magical conversations happen. So do you have any formulated best practices to govern situational decision making? Or is it entirely about having trained your gut to follow your instincts in the moment? Well, uh, okay. So with an interview, um, gosh, it's, it's, so it depends. Live on stage, this is really hard because you have no safety net and people are watching you do everything live. Right. So like I don't the know fact if, that I just clipped a little piece of dead skin off my finger off camera, I could not have done that live. Or I could well, have. Well, well, you could have. That, does, that added matter. a little it's, different flavor. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's more of the fact that every conversation takes five or 10 minutes to heat up. Right. Yeah. You got you to you preheat the oven. And so, are you, how do you get as quickly as possible to an established relationship and the good stuff? Mm -hmm. Because people don't want to sit through it. So, if it's a live conversation, I really struggle and at the same time put a lot of pressure on myself to go from zero to 100 right away. Yeah. If it's a pre recorded thing, I'll, I'll actually ask burner questions in advance that I know that I'm just going to dump. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna dump that footage. I'm gonna dump the question, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna the second or third question is my real like. Let's actually kick this off. And when you um, say pre-recorded, are you talking about video, or you do this on your podcast too? Podcast too, right? Okay. You and I, you and I, all have a one-hour conversation. Maybe a thirty-six minute podcast goes out hmm. because I may I may have burned the first eight minutes, not because it's not good or whatever. It's just because we have informed yeah. a relationship. There was a comment. I had uh, the 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 uh, founder and CEO of Moz, Rand Fishkin. Yeah, yeah, Rand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had Rand on, author of an amazing book, Lost and Founder. Um, I think we I think we burned the first six minutes of footage, and so my first question to him, we get deep really quick, and there was a comment on YouTube where someone's like, "Mark asks introductory question, Rand gets deep onto life," and <laughs> and someone someone noticed like like that I asked this this a good question, but like. It's on right away. Right, right. That's because I know proactively that I, I'm doing that. The, the other thing that I've had to train myself for is um, a few times now I've asked you, like, are, are we doing this well? Because the most fun I have in a conversation with my guest across from me gets so in the weeds that I realize that I'm serving me yeah. more than I'm serving my audience. Yeah. And so I have this poster up here on my wall for, for the viewers, for listeners. It's a poster from that I ripped off of, off of a concert venue wall in 1999. It's Ben Folds 5. And a, a few months ago, I was laying in bed thinking, you know what? It wouldn't be that hard for us to get Ben Folds on the podcast, right? He, he's a podcaster. He's an artist. I'm sure we could get him. But then it hit me. It's like, it doesn't, as much as I would love that, and as much as I could work to have it serve my audience, I, would, I wouldn't want to have an introductory conversation with, with a musician that I've been a fan of for, for yeah. almost all, like since I was 15. So, yeah. like, so like for almost all of my life, I have been a hardcore fan of this person. The conversation I want to have with Mr. Ben Folds, no one is interested in listening to because it's just so inside. It's so deep. And so the other thing I've had to do and be very careful of and conscious of is remember that, that my job is to serve the audience and to make my guest comfortable, say the right things, look good, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the role I play. I chase my curiosity. I chase my interest. I need to be engaged. I get bored very easily. So if it meets all of those things, then, then that's great. But but over the years, I've shifted away from just chasing what I love to mm -hmm. realizing that I have a responsibility to serve great content to my audience. Hmm. That's yeah, yeah. The Ben Folds example is so perfect because I too, I'm thinking if Ben Folds, if I was talking to Ben Folds, I would be like, I would want to be, I would, I would want to know all his stories that he writes a song like, who was Eddie Walker? Who was Alice wow, Childress? Wow, that's a Where deep was cut. Jackson Cannery? Like, I hey, want to know this, right? I was only on Naked Baby Photos, which uh, you can't even get anymore. I bought exactly. that album for yeah, $28. Yeah, you got that. Yes. See, yes, yeah. That, we just bonded over Esoterica, but uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I was a professional piano player, I, I, and, and songwriter. So he was a huge inspiration, like of being able to bridge popular, like basically take sophisticated music and still make it feel like a popular style. Like he was great yeah. at that. Um, yeah. But anyway, but here we go. I, I wanted to, now I just want to geek out with you about Ben Folds 5, but you're right. The odds are we are the two biggest Ben Folds fan of anybody talking or listening right now. So I'm, I'm, at a, I'm at Ben Folds 5 got together to produce one more album in like 2014, I think. I'm at mm -hmm. a concert and I turn to the person beside me to my left and I say, hey, were you here in 1999, the last time they were together? And, and this woman who turns out to be a girl is like, uh, I was two years old. And I'm, like, oh, I'm like, oh no, I'm, oh gosh, I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no it, it, we, are, we are definitely uh, aging ourselves or dating ourselves. Um, but you know, whatever and whatever, amen. Doesn't matter. I don't know what's what's your process, man. What do you what do you do? Um, sorry, you I, I had to or? I had to pause to see if you caught that. Whatever and whatever, amen. Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, yeah, no, it's it's interesting. I don't have a standard process, but what I have loved about podcasting, and I actually teach. I say teach. I will I will happily enthusiastically suggest or endorse the idea of anybody to get into podcasting because of um, the, the really the great life skill of listening that it forces you to develop. And honestly, I was an only child. I was used to voicing my needs and getting them met. And if you wouldn't meet them, I would go find someone else to listen that would. And for me, becoming a really, really intentional uh, professional, you know, I can now put professional and listener together as part of my job. Part of my job is to professionally listen to people. And I have found that it has stoked my empathy in general, in life. Like it's actually, if we will get out of our own, this was the, my experience. I said, I'm using the proverbial we, but this is for me. Getting out of my own head, getting learning to not worry about what I'm going to say next, learning to trust the natural ebb and flow of the conversational process, which by the way, human beings have been doing this for millions of, or thousands of years. It's not like, oh my gosh, what if I'm, what if I'm going to fail at having a conversation? We're probably reasonably pre-wired at this point. If like any genes of like inability to have a conversation have probably been naturally selected out a long time ago. Like we probably can do this if we'll trust ourselves right but to let ourselves and to trust ourselves and to be more interested in someone else than yourself or myself for an hour has been almost like cathartic over the last two years it's made me a better person that is so interesting because uh at christmas we had my wife's family up from virginia and uh i, I live in canada so so they came up for virginia for the first time since the pandemic, since, yeah. you know, over the two years and, uh, her husband, um, you know, they got married, they got, they got remarried. So they got married older. Her husband's a really nice guy, but he's always been very quiet, a little standoffish. And he and I have never really connected, you know, they, they come up for Christmas each year, but over the last five or six years, we've never really connected this year. They're up. And I, and I, I literally, I, I, I made the decision as I was cooking dinner for everyone, he's quietly sitting there again, we've never connected. And I thought I am going <laughs> to, damn it. I am going to connect with this guy. Right. Right. And so I go, I go, Hey, Steve, uh, he, he works, uh, gosh, I don't know how much I share. Anyway, he, he works for, he works for part of the U S government. And I go, do you like your job? And that's all I asked. And it led to like a three and a half hour conversation mm. where I got to know everything about him. But I was genuinely curious because it's like, I, I don't know anyone who works for the government who likes their job. So he's like, I do actually. I'm like, really? It doesn't, <laughs> see, it doesn't seem like you do from the stories you share. He's like, I do. Why do you like your job? And then we got into who do you report to? And how does that work? And how do you handle your caseload? Like who decides how long you spend on something and if it's worth pursuing or not? And, and there's some investigative aspects to his job. And so we got into that stuff. And then how long have you been doing it? What got you into that? And why do you do it? Oh, you're this far from retirement. Do you think you'll retire? And like, and oh, you do training? And it's just, and then, and, and, and that night as he was leaving, as they were leaving, three times he thanked me for making dinner. I've made dinner for them a bunch of times. 
he didn't thank me because I made right. a better turkey or ham or whatever than I made previous years or whatever. We, for the first time in like five or six years of, of me knowing him, like we actually connected. And it just came from me deciding, I need to take interest in this guy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know anything about him. Like, like I, I didn't know anything. My grandfather's 93, 94. Up until a few years ago, I didn't know what his favorite color was. It seems like yeah. not something important to know, but this is my grandfather. This is someone who I love and I respect, and I don't really know him that well. We don't really know the people in our lives that well. Yeah. And so that is the training ground that I also use um, to make myself better with strangers, let's say. But with strangers, it's easy, right? It's like really easy to just, I got to carry a conversation for 45 minutes and I don't know that much about them. I mean, that's really right. simple to do. Carry a conversation for a few hours with people you know really well, and then, then you'll become better. Yeah. At it. Well, so, okay, I'm going to, I may be going to contextualize, I was going to say challenge, but I don't think it's challenge. I think it's contextualized something you just said about it being easy. I think, because what I was thinking earlier when you were talking, and I realize it's, it's the same thought, it just morphed, was about how curiosity is its own reward. That like, because I think the natural challenge that a lot of people have and I say this, it's not just in having a conversation or in hosting a podcast or an interview or something. It's literally just in life is, I would call it insufficient curiosity for maximum experience. Like there's some people that just don't get everything they could out of life because they aren't curious enough to press for it. But do you think, it, do you think that's a fear or courage or do you think- Well, what I was like going to say is, I think it's from never having- fully experienced the value of curiosity. In other words, that's why I meant curiosity is its own reward. And what I've learned through this is people are more interesting than I ever realized. I love them more than I ever knew. I find them more endlessly fascinating. They're, you know, still waters run the deepest. The people that I think I'm going to get the least out of, I end up almost losing myself in the conversations. And it's really, really upped my regard and my interest in and my, my, my love for humanity. And, and what it's, it's taught me to be curious by rewarding me for what was initially forced curiosity of like, oh crap, I started a podcast, I have to ask questions. But the more I've enjoyed getting the answers, it's turned me into a more naturally curious person because I'm realizing how rewarding curiosity is. And that has improved every aspect of my life. And so when you were saying, oh, well, it's 45 minutes, somebody I don't know very well, but you've been, you've trained yourself to love the results and the, and the sensation of curiosity. So a 45 minute space for you to do that is easy, but I don't think everybody has that same relationship with curiosity because there's a vulnerability in curiosity. And you asked if it's fear, I think that could be part of it too. Like, what if I ask a dumb question? What if I don't, what if they have some expectation of me? And I don't know what I'm trying to, if it's in terms of the audience here, I am, I am trying to inspire and encourage people to get almost obsessively curious about other people and, and, and promise that there is gold on the other side of that as a habit. This, this will carry off in all areas of your life though, to, to echo or to, to pile on, I guess what you're saying, to add to what you're pile saying. On. When um, there was a time where I got really active in clubhouse Clubhouse was this social audio app yeah, yeah. that kind of grew up and then kind of fizzled out. But when I jumped on it in February of 2021, I guess, so last year in February, I was like, okay, I'm going to go really hardcore. And I'm telling my friend, Evan Carmichael, I'm like, I'm going to go really hardcore. And he's like, oh, what does that mean? I'm like, I'm going to go on twice a week. <laughs> he's like, Mark, Mark, dude, people are like living on the app 24 yeah. <laughs> seven. They're falling asleep twice a week. Not, I'm like, oh, okay. So so for me, it was a big move. I cleared my schedule and I was like, I'm going to go uh, five days a week. I'm going to go on the app and host two hours a day, five days a week. And no one showed up to begin with, and that's fine or whatever. But over the course of a few months, I got really, really good. Like two hours a day. You, you know, I know your story yeah. about piano, right? You play piano all day long, right? You, yeah. your, your fingernails are falling off. You get really good when you practice and practice and practice, when you listen back to yourself, when you challenge yourself, when 
Um, and, and I developed all of these skills to play with my cadence, yeah. to pause, to emphasize things. Now, one thing I had to break was because I was on Clubhouse, I closed my eyes all the time because I found when I closed my eyes, I could actually get into the moment more and I can get into the energy more and I could just focus on how I spoke. I say all that to say I was practicing, 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 and then suddenly I realized, oh, in my business pitches, so much better. Mm -hmm. On conference calls with people, clients, um, or, or even, you know, like uh, if we were doing something, family function, anything, you asked me how I became a professional host. Doing it a lot made me realize that in all these other areas of communications, I could just play. Yeah. If, if I'm pitching a client... I don't get stressed out or worried about it anymore because it's it's no it's it's less stressful than hosting a conversation in front of hundreds of people who are hanging on to your every word, mm -hmm. right? If if so so to to add to what you're saying, if you are naturally not gifted at maybe speaking, or listening, or the the aspects we're talking about from a podcasting point of view, this can and will come to you through training. You just have to be willing. To try, <laughs> and you're going to suck at first. I mean, go back to I don't, my first podcast was maybe in 2013 or 14. It probably wasn't very good. <laughs> so, so you just you get better over time. Yeah, and you know it's interesting. You're talking about being good, um, and I kind of said earlier, like I think anybody that is truly bad at hosting or having a conversation that that that, that probably got naturally selected out a while ago, right? Like. I heard, so I learned something interesting. I've shared this a few times. It seems to keep popping up. Um, I learned this, actually it was something I, I heard in a Jordan Peterson book, and then I went and researched it further. So I'll, I'll give you the super, super succinct version. Basically the reason that human mothers give birth after nine months, uh, when based on our size and our complexity as a mammalian species, uh, all, you know, as compared to other mammals, we ought to be in the womb for like two years. Um, and that's what I learned from Jordan Peterson. It's like, actually a mammal this size and complexity should gestate in the womb for two years, but mama spits us out after nine months. And the reason is because we have disproportionately large heads and we would literally split our poor mothers in half if they let us stay in the womb for two years, right? And the reason we have disproportionately large heads is because we have frontal lobes and our brains are dramatically different than any other animal species. Jeff, I, I just need to interrupt. And yeah. this is worth the interruption. This is why I like you, man. No, no other person would I speak to. Would I, if I woke up this morning and said, what are we going to talk about today? I would never have thought <laughs> about a baby growing so large that, that yeah. they hurt their mother. So it's a so dark this is, image. This is why people yeah. come here. This is yeah. what we're here for, guys. Well, and I mean, I'm looking at you and you have a truly beautiful head. It's shaved. I can see every contour. It's very round, very smooth. Um, so, you know, it was inevitable. This was going to happen. But, but yeah, we would, we would kill our poor mothers if they let us stay in there, uh, you know, overstay our welcome. And, but the reason is because for whatever reason, the creative force of the universe wanted us to have these big old brains that needed these big old skulls to house and particularly up front. This is where things went awry. And, it, and the, two lo the two parts of the brain that occupy the most space in the frontal lobe are the parts that control uh, complex coordinated movements and verbal expression. So my thesis is Look, some of us are better athletes than others, but we're all supposed to move, right? Yet a lot of us, because we were not rewarded or validated for athletics when we were young, we developed a dysfunctional relationship with movement, and now we just don't even take care of ourselves, right? I think the same thing, but, we're, but I don't think anybody argues that we're all supposed to move, and we're all very good at moving in the way that our body is designed to move. I think the same is true of verbal expression. I think that we're all designed to be out loud verbal communicators, but because some of us did not get validation or recognition of that at certain developmental times in our life, we developed a dysfunctional relationship with verbal expression where we redefined ourselves as somebody that's not good at that. But I think saying I'm not good, I'm not a good communicator is no different, is like saying I'm not, a, I'm not good at motion. It's that elemental to us. And my, again, my thesis is that 
the evolutionary force or whatever force was using evolution as a mechanism for creating homo sapiens, it was so insistent that we be natural at both movement and verbal expression that it hijacked evolutionary biology, rewrote the script on childbirth, created this, these weird collapsible heads that come out as points with a, with a soft, mushy spot. Like, and, and by the way, natural selection is supposed to eliminate anything that makes childbirth more dangerous, right? Like that, those traits are not supposed to carry on according to Darwin. And yet human childbirth is one of the most dangerous childbirths in the, in the mammalian kingdom because of this head issue. So it was so important to God or the universe or whoever, I'm not taking a religious position, but it was so important that we be able to have complex coordinated movement and verbal expression that it literally hijacked Darwinian evolution to make it possible. And here we have the audacity to say, oh no, I'm not a good communicator. I'm not supposed to do that. Bullshit. Where does in this having fun and liking it come into account? Because, because you know, like, <laughs> like well, because I was just thinking as you were responding. Did I get, did I get a little too intense there? Is that well, what you're no, it's me? not that. It's just not that. It's just, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. But, but the thing is, I, I love this. Like, I like the attention. I like the status. I like the control. I like the challenge. I am curious. You're right. I am, I am doing all those things. Um, I got in a, convers- a debate with Evan, like Evan Carmichael again, if I mentioned Evan, my friend Evan. Um, I got in a debate with him because he believes everyone should be an entrepreneur. I do not believe that. I believe everyone can be an entrepreneur, but I just think lots of people don't want it. And it's not like they're broken. They just, they just don't want it. It's not for them. And so I agree with what you're saying, that everyone can improve. Uh, just like they can become more athletic, they can become better communicators, better listeners, mm-hmm. better engagers, better presenters. I just don't think a lot of people find yeah, it fun. I agree. No, I, <laughs> yeah, not everybody's meant to be, not everybody's meant to use verbal expression as a you know, crowbar into professional opportunities any more than everybody's meant to use movement as a gateway into becoming a professional athlete. But I think that everybody's meant to communicate. And I think that it, there's a lot of repressed, uh, sort of weight, missed out upon experiential possibility in lives because of the way people have misidentified themselves as non-natural communicators or non-gifted. You know, they have like an insecurity yeah. around it, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to host a podcast, but I, but I, I think everybody can benefit from, like, we, like I said, increased curiosity and a willingness to experience the rewards of that curiosity by having deep connection that's created through engaging conversation. And whether you ever, whether you ever do it professionally or not, I guarantee you this, whatever your professional uh, ambitions are, they will be bolstered yes. through great conversations. Yes, I would agree with you. And I will circle around on something you mentioned early on, which was how you didn't realize empathy. Uh, you're, mm. You become more empathetic to others simply by the process of doing this. I didn't realize that either because, you know, I, I am natural. I shouldn't say naturally. I have found myself to be a, a very judgmental person. And I didn't realize how judgmental I was to others, but I definitely believed that people were judging me. And only in me realizing that those who fear judgment from others actually are very judgmental by, by trait um, and, and realizing it's the same, it's, it's two different sides of the same coin. All of this to say, I've hit the point now where I, I react to someone that I don't like or I judge. And I've literally, I've, I have turned to my wife at times and said, you know what? I need you to tell me more about this person because the more I know about them, the more I'll come to like them. And I've hit this part where consciously now I realize if this is someone who I'm feeling a certain way about, I just need them, I just need them to give me more backstory. Just, just help me understand. And we see this in storytelling. We see this in movies all the time. You can have a villain, you know, Dexter, the TV show Dexter. The guy was a serial killer, and yet mm-hmm. we liked him because we understood his perspective. We understood his motives and his reasoning. And so to empathy is so huge and i've realized now that that if there's someone that i'm that i'm kind of reacting to i almost just make an effort to get to know them better sometimes you're like nope 
<laughs> I was right. There's not much to that. But more often than not, I go, oh, shucks. They're really an awesome person. And they were doing things for the right reasons. And I have to let go of my anger or my judgment or my resentment or my jealousy mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Because it turns out they're pretty awesome. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's a there's actually a, I was trying to Google it real fast, but I can't remember even what to what to look up. There's actually a type of therapy. Um, and it's I, I keep wanting to say exposure, but it's not exposure because exposure therapy is different. It's but it's basically like like they can actually like cure like racism. Like if a if a if a if a racist white guy spends enough time around or, or a racist any guy it doesn't why do i assume, why, now i'm racist i assume that the racist is a white guy it's not right? racist you're just yeah. using an example that's fine in Thank this in right. this illustration <laughs> yes in this illustration um if 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 basically somebody spends enough time with the people about whom they have a prejudice eventually it heals the prejudice and I can't, there's a, there's a guy, uh, a movement, maybe if you, it, we don't have to go down this, this road. If you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, Jeff, but does it ring any bells of there's some guy who's out there like filming stories of all these different types of people and all these different conversations between different types of people to create like this engine for healing so that anybody can, can listen to the story of any type of person at any time to help them deal with whatever they're dealing with. Does that ring any bells to you? It doesn't, but it sounds cool. <laughs> it's so cool. And anyone in the audience, help us out. If you know what we're talking about, please leave a comment, tag me, send me an Instagram DM, send Mark an Instagram DM. Like we got, I got to find this cause it's really cool. But in any, in any case, I agree with you. Um, conversation, communication, by the way, even the term commune, communication. It's literally what links us in the commune. It's, it's how, I think it's how you, how you discover the full range of emotional experience. You know, Mark, I, uh, I do. I think we've made our point. First of all, I'm going to break the fourth wall here and say, you also, I also feel like you gave me and my editing team permission to like just carve the stuff up. And it, it's almost like the editors oh. get to have their own creative product. They, like their job is not to perfectly document our yes. conversation. It's to yes. use it as raw material to make something awesome. Perfect. So thank you so much. Yes, this is a key point, which is, which is we as storytellers, as, as, as marketers, as whatever it is, we are not journalists and we are not documentarians or biographers. Our job is not for the, for the centuries ahead to make sure that this is perfectly encapsulated as exactly what took place. Our job is to serve the audience. And that's to tell the best story possible, to teach the lesson possible or what have you. So not only do we burn footage to begin with, we move stuff out of order. Often in the last 20 to 30 minutes uh, of, of a conversation, things start to get really good. We will, like at least in our podcast, I, I'm, I'm giving away secrets now, but we will, we will drop entire segments. We will cut out the beginning of stuff. I will pick up questions if I didn't, get to the crux of the question properly. So I will, at the end of the episode, when it's all done, actually, I'll typically re-record my intro question or my opening. Um, we will pick up questions after the fact, uh, and we will move things in and out of order to tell the best story to whatever point we're trying to make possible. Hmm. Now, people might say, and, and when I was young, I would, I would worry that my guest would fear me taking out of context the point that they were trying to make. And that is, that is an issue, you know, like if you have no, let's say moral compass, if all you were doing was serving just yourself or the audience, you can make people say whatever it is you want to say. Right. But, but my job is to serve the audience and to make my guests look good. And so as long as I'm holding both of those things above my own, now, now I do have my own mission. Like your mission is to make sure you said it so well, right? Like for people to be able to hit their full potential. Unlock their full potential and design their dream life. Perfect. Mine, I realize, is and has always been, I want to be people's cheerleaders. And I, I, I want them to realize that, that a happy life comes from pursuing your passions at all costs. Hmm. It is always worth whatever sacrifice, whatever risk, whatever hard thing, whatever challenge, whatever 
thing sets you back to today, but it is always worth pursuing your passion at all costs. That is ultimately the way that you will avoid regrets. You will grow. You will challenge yourself. And we do hard things, whole mission. The people I speak to secretly behind the scenes, it always comes back to that. Mm -hmm. And so when we are looking at a story or a podcast or an episode, I don't want boring moments. I don't want any tangents that, that aren't fun or entertaining or take us away from our mission. And I want to make sure that we're crafting whatever story we're telling, whatever lesson it is around proving our point. And, and my mission is to show that these people either have or can help you do what you need to do to pursue your passions at all costs. Man, that's awesome. A, uh, a free masterclass in podcast production, courtesy of one of the best, uh, Mark. Honestly, I, I feel like I owe you for a consulting session. That was like, that was really valuable insight. But seriously, this has been so great. It's so great to reconnect, man, and, uh, and see you again. And I hope, I know this isn't gonna be, it's not gonna be our last conversation. I hope it's not our last podcast. Well, it better not be. <laughs> yeah. For Stay sure. tuned, audience, for the Jeff and Mark happy hour. Yeah. Uh, we'll get a few of our friends together and we'll just do a chit chat podcast. Well, what do they call it now where people eat together? Have you seen that? I haven't seen it. Oh man, that's a whole other thing. It's like a trend on YouTube where like they, it's like they, somebody brings food over and they just film themselves sitting around eating and talking. It's kind of like a new twist <laughs> on podcasts. I don't know. There's a term for it. Well, I'll ask my son. Uh, my kids are much cooler, obviously, than I am. Here's a hot take. I guess when the conversation isn't interesting enough, you got to come up with a shtick to make it more interesting. Yeah, I guess like zoom in on the pizza. We need to fill space or something. That's actually, yeah. that's actually not even true, though, because the Hot Wings the hot wings show is amazing, right? Yeah. Where people take progressively hotter oh, yeah. and hotter. Oh, yeah. That is pretty great. That yeah, is pretty so. great. Anyway, uh, well, seriously, I know, I know you got to go. You have to go do uh, dad duty. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Real quick, invite the audience into your world. Projects, social media, however you want them to come find you. Please let them know how. Yeah, come on. Check out the podcast on YouTube. Just look up my name, Mark Drager, or We Do Hard Things. Or if you're more interesting in the branding side of what we do, you can check out my company, Fanta.com, P-H-A-N-T-A.com. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. What am I willing to learn? If you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. Ignorance today is a choice. If you are willing to learn, no one can stop you from creating your own personal economy. This is where we are right now.